Hello, and welcome to Being Well. I'm Forrest Hansen. If you're new to the show, thanks for joining us today. And if you've listened before, welcome back. My guest today is Dr. Chris Palmer. Dr. Palmer is a board-certified psychiatrist and assistant professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School. His clinical practice focuses on helping people suffering from treatment-resistant mental illnesses, including mood disorders, psychotic disorders, and personality disorders. And he's been involved in psychiatric research for well over 20 years. He's focused his research on the areas of metabolism, metabolic disorders, and their connection to mental disorders. And this work led to his book, Brain Energy, A Revolutionary Breakthrough in Understanding Mental Health and Improving Treatment for Anxiety, Depression, OCD, PTSD, and more. I've been looking forward to this conversation for a while. I've been doing a lot of prep for it. And uh, Chris was kind enough to change the date and time of the conversation when I got a little sick before we were last supposed to record. So Chris, thanks for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on the show, Forrest. I've been really looking forward to this one, um, including because I've had to learn a lot. I've had to learn a lot about the body's uh, metabolic systems. I've had to learn a lot about all of these various neurotransmitters. It has been great for me. But I often find that it helps to ground these conversations and the person that I'm talking to, because there's an old line that I'm sure you're familiar with, research is me-search. And uh, it tends to be the case that people's experiences lead to what they end up focusing on. So I would love to start by asking you, how did your own experiences with mental illness influence both your work with patients and your brain energy theory more broadly? Yeah, so that's a really long, complicated answer. I'll give you the short version. <laughs> I would love the short version. The short version is that I had my own struggles with mental illness when I was a kid. Started off mm. as OCD by the time I was in even kindergarten. I had OCD. It was never recognized or diagnosed. I never got treatment for it. Nobody knew what it was. They just thought I was weird and doing weird things. And then when I was about 12, a, a whole series of tragic events happened in my family. And the quick story is that my mom ended up having what she called a nervous breakdown. And it started with depression, turned into depression with suicidal ideation. And then she became psychotic um, and actually developed all sorts of delusions about the world ending. And she was Mary Magdalene and all this other kind of stuff. That led to my parents getting divorced. I actually went to live with my mom. She, and I, that was a really horrible time in my life. Um, she and I were actually homeless together for a little while. People often ask me, like, why are you a psychiatrist? To kind of get more to the point of your question. Like, why, Chris Palmer, why are you a psychiatrist? The mm -hmm. main reason is because I was so angry with the mental health field for not being able to help my mother get better. Um, she never got better. She did everything they wanted her to do. She took the pills they wanted her to. She was hospitalized. She went to psychotherapy. Um, and mental illness ruined her life. It literally ruined her life. Um, it ruined our family. It, certainly, I can look back on it and say I suffered as a result, but that really wasn't my concern. And even to this day, isn't my concern. My concern was this was a good, decent human being and she didn't do anything wrong. And why couldn't the medical profession help her? Like, what is wrong with this medical profession that they couldn't help her? That is why I went into psychiatry. And that is what is what has driven me ever since. So the focus of your work, as you're saying right now, is what we call treatment-resistant conditions. Uh, would you mind explaining briefly what those are and why we currently have struggles with them? So treatment resistant basically just means people who have a mental illness um, and have gotten a lot of treatment, have usually tried lots of medications, have tried years or decades of psychotherapy and other treatments, and they're just not getting better. And it, it can apply to any psychiatric condition. So you could have a treatment resistant schizophrenia and bipolar disorder, which more often than not are the norm. A lot of people with schizophrenia do not get better. Um, and, you know, they don't, we don't restore their normal life and their normal health. Um, and so most people with schizophrenia end up with what we would call a treatment resistant illness. 
but people with chronic depression can have treatment mm-hmm. resistant depression. They can try dozens of antidepressants, mood stabilizers, antipsychotics. They can get ECT and TMS and ketamine injections and still be crippled by depression. People with personality disorders, substance use disorders, it's across the board. So there you are in your practice. You're a psychiatrist at this point. You're working with people out in the field. You're prescribing the medications. You're doing the best you can. And you're still bumping your head against the ceiling of these issues that we have with efficacy of various medications inside of the field. Even when they work for some people, they don't work for others. Some people are well served by them. Some people are not. And so understandably, you're you're looking around, you're hunting for something a little bit different or a little bit better, and you're starting to work with people inside of your own practice. And I remember, I believe that it was a patient that you had who had schizoaffective disorder who ended up becoming a really powerful case study for you and influenced the later development of your brain energy theory. And I was wondering if you could just share a little bit about that. So yeah, this is a patient who... Um had been a patient of mine for eight years at that point in time, in 2016. He had schizoaffective disorder, which for those who don't know, is kind of a cross between schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. He had hallucinations and delusions. He was terrified to go out in public. He was convinced Mm. that everybody was out to get him, that people were trying to hurt him, that people were looking at him. If somebody just glanced in his direction, they were part of the conspiracy. So this man was tormented by his illness. His life was ruined. He lived with his dad. He had tried 17 different medications, but none of them stopped his symptoms. He had gained a tremendous amount of weight, though, from those medications. Which is fairly common if I'm, is, is that correct? Yeah. It is exceedingly common. Right on the package inserts for those medications are the warnings that these medications cause weight gain, they cause type 2 diabetes, they cause increased risk for cardiovascular disease. Yeah. He somehow gets it in his mind that he wants to lose weight. And um, he asks for my help. And so I'm delighted. He's got a goal. He wants to do something to improve his life. Let's, great, let's do it. For a variety of reasons, we try the ketogenic diet. Now, I had had a long history of using the ketogenic diet for depression and other things, but I really didn't expect it to do anything for this particular man because he had this horrible crippling psychotic disorder. And within two weeks, not only did he start losing weight, but I began to notice kind of this powerful antidepressant effect. He was like coming to life. He was making better eye contact, talking more, but he still was having hallucinations and delusions. And I thought that's really interesting though, that it's having this powerful antidepressant effect in him. And then the thing that just upended everything that I knew as a psychiatrist was about six to eight weeks in, he spontaneously begins reporting that his long-standing hallucinations are going away, that his paranoid delusions are starting to go away, that he was beginning to realize that they weren't true, probably never had been, much more important than weight loss. He was able to do things he hadn't been able to do since the time of his diagnosis. He was able to complete a certificate program, go out in public and not be paranoid, He's, he actually um, teaches karate now. He was able to perform improv in front of a live audience. And all of that sent me on this journey to understand what on earth just happened and how can I understand this? Yeah, and that then resulted in the theory, the book, all of the things they were talking about today. And I do want to dig into that. Um, before we do that, to ground what we're going to be talking about a little bit, I think that it would be helpful here just to distinguish between a mental or an emotional state and mental illness more broadly and how you think about the differences between those two things. Because so far we've talked about very significant levels of mental illness with something like schizoaffective disorder. Yeah. So, so right now, you know, 
The Diagnostic and Statistical Manual put out by the American Psychiatric Association has this laundry list of diagnostic categories. And there are a lot of names that people know, schizophrenia, bipolar, depression, anorexia nervosa. And most people understand what those things mean, and we get a pretty clear picture of what they mean. Um, But the reality is that, surprisingly to most people, they are not valid disease constructs. Um, And that actually comes from the former head of the National Institute of Mental Health. Um, He says, these are not valid constructs. And the reason we're not making better progress in the mental health field is because we keep pretending they are. We need to move on. Um, One of the challenges, you know, there are many challenges with this work and with our diagnostic labels, but one of them is distinguishing between what I call mental states and what I call mental disorders. So to give a clear example, all of us have anxiety. Anxiety is a normal human condition. And if you have anxiety because you have a stressful situation or a test or whatever, that is normal. That is not a mental disorder. It's not a mental illness. It it is being a normal human being. But where our field starts to go off a little bit is that if somebody, if a kid is being bullied and teased relentlessly for weeks on end, that kid may have anxiety for more than a month. And that kid gets diagnosed with a brain disorder that we call an anxiety disorder Hmm. with no regard for the cause of his quote unquote disorder. Yeah, no context. What I'm arguing is that that kid is a normal human being. Any kid in that situation is going to have anxiety, maybe even extreme anxiety, and that that kid's brain is not malfunctioning. And we should not pretend that that kid has a chemical imbalance in his brain. We should not pretend that that kid has a brain disorder. Does that kid need help? Yes, he needs help. He's in trouble. He's being bullied and teased, and he's feeling unsafe and threatened. What are the appropriate treatments? Well, let's stop the bullying and teasing. Or let's teach the kid how to stand up for himself or fight yeah. back or whatever, whatever intervention people want. We're reducing stressors or we're adding resources, you know, classic model. Totally. Yes. There are lots of solutions, but the cause is obvious. Um, likewise, w- this comes up a lot with post-traumatic stress disorder. So post-traumatic yeah. stress disorder, you have to have symptoms for one month, but there's no... There's no even hint at whether the abuse is still going on or not. Like nobody in their right mind should think of that as a brain disorder. Nobody should be thinking about that as a chemical imbalance. And yet that is the way DSM describes them. And unfortunately, that is the way some clinicians will treat them. You've got PTSD. Here's a pill to treat it. The reality is, we treat women who are in abusive relationships who are still being abused. And we treat them for PTSD. And they start getting prescriptions and other things when the treatment may not be prescriptions. The treatment may be helping that woman get out of that environment or helping that kid who's being bullied and teased get out of that environment. So I think there are lots of situations. But yet, as a psychiatrist, I believe there are people who do have brain disorders where their brains are malfunctioning. People with schizophrenia or schizoaffective disorder, people who are manic and psychotic, people who have unrelenting depression for no good reason. I think that their brains are in fact malfunctioning and that we need to better understand why a brain, a human brain would malfunction so that we can better understand how to help those people recover. 
That's great. It's great context for everything that we're about to talk about because you're talking about the different sources, these various things that can lead to a mental illness, right? And there's some inherent fuzziness here, at least in my understanding, and I would love some clarification from you. Because when somebody is exposed to chronic toxic stress, whatever the circumstance might be that's causing it for a long enough period of time, it can actually lead to the the system to develop around that chronic stress in a way that becomes problematic for, for basic functioning. And this is where you look at things like developmental experiences and adverse childhood experiences as being risk factors for things that we later go on to label as mental illness. And one of the things that you were really interested in exploring, I think, in this, in this book and in your work, is that we think of mental disorders as coming from many different places. You know, genetics, difficult life circumstances, difficult emotions over a long enough period of time, uh, chemical poisoning, uh, even things like a lack of, of meaning in your life. So how can all of those various things lead to all of these different conditions that then themselves have some overlap in symptomology? It all starts to become a very snarly knot. And so your brain energy theory does a pretty good job of slicing right through that. And so I would love if we could kind of turn to it and maybe you could answer the uh, the implicit question and what I'm saying here. Yeah. So there is no doubt it is a big tangled mess. And the easiest way to think about it is, so we have situations that are kind of common sense. The kid being bullied and teased somebody experiencing stress or trauma, somebody having an infection and having changes in mood or energy level. Those are all mm -hmm. obvious. Like that's what's causing yeah. it. But at the end of the day, what I'm arguing is that the things that we call brain disorders, when people's brains are malfunctioning, when people are having anxiety for no good reason, when people have unrelenting depression, when people have hallucinations or delusions, that there is a unifying way, big picture way to understand how all of those different risk factors that you listed off come together and can cause the brain to malfunction. And the simplest way to say it is what I'm arguing is that brain disorders are metabolic disorders of the brain. And, and so in order to understand what that means, you have to understand metabolism. But if people do a deep dive into the science of what we call metabolism, and more specifically, these tiny things in our cells called mitochondria, if you do a deep dive into the science of those, you can actually once and for all, connect the dots of the mental health field. You can begin to understand how genetics and trauma and stress and hormones and substance use like marijuana or alcohol use, neurotransmitters, hormones, how all of these things can fit together and result in a brain that is malfunctioning. Mm -hmm. and, and at the end of the day, a malfunctioning brain, the easiest way to think about it is you've got brain cells or brain circuits that are either overactive or underactive. And so in other words, if, if somebody's having a panic attack for no reason, the brain circuits that control anxiety and panic symptoms is, are overactive. Likewise, if somebody has ADHD, for instance, maybe the brain circuits that help them focus and pay attention are underactive. That, in a nutshell, is the theory that mental disorders are metabolic in nature, or that they are metabolic disorders affecting the brain, and that we can actually piece together all of the risk factors for mental illness in this one unifying way. I think most importantly, the theory then, number one, gives us some clarity on the mental health field, gives us some clarity on some really interesting and important connections between what we call mental illness and physical illness. 
So people with mental disorders have a whole range of physical disorders on top of their mental disorders. They're more likely to have gut problems and um, or GI problems. They're more likely to have autoimmune disorders. They're more likely to have heart attacks and strokes. They're more likely to develop diabetes, obesity, and they're more likely to die early deaths across the board, across all diagnostic categories. And so the the, one of the really important things about this theory is it's once and for all a way to connect what we call mental illness and physical illness. So when people hear the word metabolism, they tend to think about it in terms of like, how quickly do I burn fat and calories? And some people have a faster metabolism, some people have a slower metabolism. That's kind of like most people's entry level on metabolic function. And I would love it if you could explain the metabolic system and what it's really doing doing in our body and how it reaches into all of these different um, different areas that you're describing. The simplest way to describe metabolism is that it is actually fundamental to all living organisms. It's actually part of the definition of a living organism. If an organism cannot do metabolism on its own, many biologists will say that is not an independent living organism. And viruses are a perfect example of that. So viruses can perpetuate themselves, but they can't do metabolism on their own. They take over our metabolic machinery if they invade us um, or another organism's metabolic machinery. And so metabolism in many ways is just, it's huge picture, huge picture of what does it mean to be a living organism. Fundamentally, it involves three things. It's taking food and oxygen and turning it into energy or building blocks that get used to make cells or maintain cells. And it also involves the management of waste products. So metabolism is really about taking all the food and water that we put in our mouths and making us. It, it, that, that food and water is turning into our cells and the proteins in our cells and the membranes of our cells. But more importantly, even, that food and water is turning into energy in the form of what's called ATP, and that keeps us alive. That keeps us going. As soon as metabolism stops, that is actually the definition of death. Um, when metabolism stops, we die. So, so the reason metabolism is so important is because it impacts the development of cells, and this gets into neurodevelopmental disorders like autism spectrum and other disorders. It affects the structure of cells, the function of cells, the, and the maintenance of cells. And ultimately, if there are problems with metabolism, cells will shrivel up and or die. And all of those things are related to what we call mental illness. So earlier you mentioned mitochondria, and if people uh, remember their high school biology class, they might recall that it is the powerhouse of the cell, so-called. But I would love it if you explained what those are in more detail and their importance to this general metabolic process. So yeah, the, the definition that you gave, powerhouse of the cell, is the one most people know. And yeah. that's still correct. Powerhouse of the cell means they take food and oxygen and turn it into ATP. And that is still true. But research over the last 20 years has completely shattered that simplistic notion of what mitochondria are. So mitochondria are actually extraordinarily complicated. And the more we learn about mitochondria, the more complex they become. And actually, the more we realize wow, we have so much to learn about them. Mitochondria, there are hundreds or thousands of them in our cells. They actually move around cells. They uh, fuse with each other. They bud off from each other. But critically important to the mental health field, here's the quick snapshot. They are involved in the production and regulation of neurotransmitters like serotonin and dopamine. They are involved in 
the human stress response, turning it on and off. They are involved in something called epigenetics or the expression of genes from our cell nucleus. They are involved in inflammation, turning it both on and off. For anybody familiar with the mental health field, you likely know that those are the big dots of the mental illness puzzle. How do neurotransmitters and trauma and stress and hormones and inflammation, how does all of that fit together? Mitochondria are the only way to fit those together. And what I'm arguing is that once people understand this science, we can actually start to begin to understand what exactly is causing mental illness. Much more importantly, what can we do about it? Let's get a little bit technical here for a moment. I would love to get into this in more detail. What's the role that mitochondria play in producing those key neurotransmitters that you were mentioning a second ago? Like, How does that process work? So mitochondria are taking food that we eat, um, often in the form of glucose or or pyruvate, uh, other molecules, and they end up breaking those molecules down. Mm -hmm. And uh, in something that's called the Krebs citric acid cycle. So a lot of people may have heard of that. So the Krebs citric acid cycle actually has a lot of intermediate molecules. So it, 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 you're taking a glucose molecule and you're slowly but surely breaking it apart and turning it into other molecules. All of my high school biology is coming back here, Chris. This is very entertaining <laughs> for me, but please keep going. Sorry. I'm just like having, flash, having flashbacks to 10th grade or 11th say, grade right now. I am so sorry to be traumatizing <laughs> you with science and with no, all it's great. I love it. nerdy stuff, but I'm so, I'm so into it. Turns out that many of those intermediate molecules of the Krebs citric acid cycle are actually critical building blocks for some of the neurotransmitters like serotonin, dopamine, GABA, glutamate, and others. So Mm -hmm. that's part of it, is that mitochondria are taking food and breaking it down, and then it's getting that food is getting converted into these molecules Mm -hmm. that are the building blocks for some of these neurotransmitters. Probably more importantly mitochondria play a much more direct role in the release of neurotransmitters. So neurotransmitters often get um, put into these little bubbles called vesicles that are inside our nerve cells or neurons. And when the signal to release them comes, the neurotransmitter vesicles get released. But mitochondria are actually shepherding these vesicles to the cell membrane and actually playing an active role, not just providing the ATP. They are doing that, but they're actually doing more than just providing the energy needed to release these neurotransmitters. And uh, and then there are some complicated stories with specific neurotransmitters like GABA, where mitochondria are actually taking GABA inside of themselves, and that's playing a direct role in how much GABA is getting released. Bottom line is that if mitochondria are impaired in any way, it's going to lead to either overactive or underactive release of these key neurotransmitters. And what does that mean? That starts to get at this quote-unquote chemical imbalance that so many psychiatrists and neuroscientists have been talking about, what would dysregulate a nerve cell? What would dysregulate the release of these neurotransmitters? We have to understand mitochondria in order to answer that question. There is no way around it. There literally is no way around it. And so what you're really doing with your theory is you're, in my understanding, I'm going to put these into my words and then you can say it back to me if you would like to 
add any addendums to it, is it's an attempt to create a holistic understanding of mental illness with mitochondria as the common pathway for these various issues that people experience. And so to put it very, very simply, happy metabolism, happy mitochondria, lower instance of mental illness. Hopefully, if we can heal that pathway, we can improve some of the symptomology that people experience around it. And if that's the case, if this theory is true, then the interventions that we currently have that are to some degree effective, they are not perfect, they often come with extremely problematic side effects, uh, they don't work for everybody. When they work, they often only work in a limited way, as you know, far better than I do. Um, if that's the case, then those interventions must be doing something to our metabolism. And I could imagine somebody listening to this right now going, wait, so you're telling me that um, my prolonged course of therapy that was extremely helpful for dealing with this longstanding mental issue that I had affected my metabolism in some way? Like, what gives here? And I would love it if you could explain a little bit more about that. Yeah, let me, maybe I'll address it with the two big buckets of treatment, which are the medications and psychotherapy that you brought up. Great. And, and yeah. we can even talk about others if you want, transcranial magnetic stimulation or others. But the two big buckets are pills or therapy. So with pills, we have very good data already several decades of basic science research documenting that the pills that we prescribe affect metabolism. Some of them improve metabolism in the brain. And we have direct evidence from that from brain scans, for instance, from metabolic brain scans. Antidepressants in particular often improve brain energy metabolism. Um, and it's, it's improving metabolism where there's a problem with metabolism. So interestingly, mm. there was one study that looked at a specific antidepressant called Paxil or paroxetine, which is like Prozac or Zoloft. That antidepressant changed brain metabolism, but in people who had depression, it changed it in one region, and in people who had OCD, it changed it in a different brain region. So what that helps, what this theory helps us begin to understand is why are the exact same treatments, like an SSRI, why are they used for different conditions like OCD and depression and PTSD and alcoholism and personality disorders and bipolar disorder and lots of other disorders? This helps us begin to understand that is because it's having broad effects on brain metabolism. And so if there are areas of the brain that are metabolically impaired, these medications can sometimes address that metabolic impairment. The worrisome thing, and one of the biggest controversies of this theory, and I think one of the biggest calls to action of this theory, is that we do prescribe medicines that can impair metabolism. So anybody who's taken these already knows it. We prescribe medicines that make people gain weight that make people develop diabetes, that make people have higher risk for cardiovascular disease, those are all harmful to metabolism. And, and I outline much of the science of why those medications can still be helpful in some people for, with some conditions because they can mm. actually slow brain metabolism even more which can stop something called hyperexcitability in your neurons. Now, that can be life-saving if somebody is psychotic or if somebody is really agitated and aggressive. But I think we need to really seriously take a, a better look at what are we doing to people long-term if we're keeping them on these medicines that might be impairing metabolism. With that said, I have to say 
please, if you just heard this, if you are on medications, if you know somebody on medications, please, please, please do not stop your medicine on your own. Do not try to reduce your medicine on your own. Do not do that. You must talk with your prescriber to to have an informed conversation, learn more about this metabolic theory of mental illness, think about maybe other treatments that you might want to pursue and have a conversation with your healthcare professional about what might be right for you because it needs to be done in a really safe way. Mm. So that's medications. The other bucket that you asked about is psychotherapy. And there's there's no doubt that psychotherapy is immensely helpful for a lot of people. Many people mm-hmm. have been saved. They will say, my, my therapist saved my life. It is almost undeniable, though, that psychotherapy is playing a role in metabolism. And I'll walk you through just a few of the examples. Yeah, so I would love an explanation of that. So one is that let's go back to just normal, everyday mental states people who are experiencing stress and adversity. So stress, the stress response, the human stress response includes release of cortisol. Cortisol directly impacts our metabolism. Undeniable. Because when we give medications like prednisone that mimic cortisol, that is what prednisone is. is It's a cortisol mimicking medication. When we give prednisone, it has profound metabolic effects on weight, on diabetes, on cardiovascular risk, on mental symptoms, on all of it. So, So if somebody is in a stressful situation, and it could be as simple as, I haven't found anybody to date, and I'm really lonely, and I just need some help. I just really could use somebody to talk to and help me through this. Profound loneliness, sadness, actually impact metabolism. That causes a chronic stress response. We have really good detailed science. I'm always torn. Like, do you want me to nerd out right now and go into oh, the I, all I, detailed this is science? A nerd out, this is a or, nerd out podcast, Chris. <laughs> You've come to the right place for this kind of activity. So particularly for this, and the reason that I want to hammer this is because we're going we're gonna to talk in a second about the ketogenic diet and these various interventions that affect metabolism. And a lot of the coverage of of your work has focused on these more like dietary interventions and what we eat. and, and and that's all fair because for starters, it is a key pathway that impacts metabolism. But what I think has been kind of undercovered actually about your book, and you spend a huge section of the book talking about it, is all of these interventions that impact metabolism that are not diet. And I think that this question about the impact of psychotherapy, and now you're talking about loneliness and connection and a chronic stress response related to these things really gets to that in a very interesting way and also is a response to one of the the primary critiques or one of the primary uh, things that people just might be thinking when they're hearing you talk about this because we know that there are all of these other factors that influence us in these really meaningful ways. So if you can connect the dots on like sense of meaning and purpose or human connection and metabolic response, that would be awesome. That would be great. So let me stick with the loneliness one. And, and I can dive into any, I, we can dive into trauma, we can dive into adverse childhood experiences, whatever, but let me stick with the loneliness one. So we know that loneliness, loneliness increases risk for a wide variety of mental illnesses. Yeah. Now, most of you are like, well, of course. Depression, yeah. Anxiety, sure alcoholism. Yeah, yeah, I can see that. Insomnia. Yeah, why not? All sorts of mental illnesses are associated with loneliness. No, lo- loneliness can make those worse. Mm-hmm. Loneliness also increases your risk for a heart attack and mm-hmm. a stroke. Loneliness increases your risk for premature mortality. People who score high on loneliness 
surveys are more likely to have heart attacks, strokes, and die early deaths. Those are metabolic. Death is metabolic failure. Heart attack is a metabolic disorder. Stroke is a metabolic disorder. We know that we know some of the details of this. Loneliness is increasing cortisol levels. So cortisol is playing a role in some of this. Loneliness also increases levels of inflammation. That is part of the stress response. Inflammation is taking a metabolic toll. So and, and it happens in several ways. So number one is that. We have to use, the human body has to use resources to make inflammation. Like inflammation is all of these proteins and new cells being produced. So part of it is just that, that metabolic resources are going to this. But inflammation in and of itself affects metabolism of other cells. It can suppress metabolism even in some specific brain cells. And so that is one way to think about something like that most people think of as a psychological or a social risk factor, loneliness. And most people think, well, the treatment for that is psychotherapy. And there's no doubt, psychotherapy may in fact be the best treatment for that. But given that loneliness is also increasing your risk for heart attacks and strokes and premature mortality, we might in some cases want to think more comprehensively about other treatments to make sure we're trying to reduce the risk of that heart attack or that stroke sure. or that premature mortality. I'll stop there, but I forget, did you ask me something else that you wanted me to respond to? No, I, I think that that's totally great. This is really helpful. You're connecting the dots between how um, interventions or experiences that we don't immediately think of as being uh, metabolic or body-based, we think of them in that more kind of social-emotional context, can have an interplay between each other that allows us to keep on connecting the dots on your broader theory. And now that we've done that, I would love to kind of go back to one of the very first things you talked about in the conversation, which was this particular case study where you had a patient that you were working with where they were on the 17 medications, it wasn't really helping out, and you then tried to go into dietary modification and see what would happen. And earlier we talked about metabolism, mitochondria, keeping the mitochondria happy in all of these different ways. And I would love it if we could do just a, a quick section here on the ketogenic diet as one intervention that can work for some people that can support our mitochondria. So how does that work? Unbeknownst to most people, this diet actually was developed over 100 years ago now by a physician for one and only one purpose. It was not developed as a weight loss diet. It wasn't developed to be the latest nutritionally you know, sound intervention. It was developed to stop seizures. Yeah. So this is an evidence-based treatment for epilepsy. We now have many randomized controlled trials of the ketogenic diet for epilepsy. And we have in the medical field, there are these things called Cochrane reviews, which are gold standard meta-analyses of all of the research. Um, and we've got two Cochrane reviews that in fact confirm that yes, the ketogenic diet is highly effective at stopping seizures, in particular in people with treatment-resistant epilepsy. And because of that, one of the reasons this is so important to me as a psychiatrist is because we use epilepsy treatments in psychiatry all the time. Many of the medications that we use for psychiatric patients, in fact, were first developed to treat epilepsy. Things like Depakote, Tegretol, Neurontin, or Gabapentin, Clonopin, Xanax, Valium, all of those are anti-seizure medicines. But you probably, any of your listeners who have had mental health treatment or know anybody who's had mental health treatment probably know some of those names because you're, oh yeah, I know somebody who was on that. They weren't on it for epilepsy probably. They were probably on it for a mental health condition. 
And so in many ways, what I'm doing with the ketogenic diet is nothing different than using those epilepsy types of treatments in people with mental illness. We actually have a tremendous amount of research. Researchers, neuroscientists, biotech companies have been studying this diet relentlessly for decades, trying to better understand how on earth does a diet stop seizures even when our medicines don't. And so we know a lot about this diet. This diet changes neurotransmitter systems. It decreases brain inflammation. It changes the gut microbiome. And you know, there's a gut-brain connection. So it's doing all sorts of things. But most important and central to my theory, it, it improves mitochondria and mitochondrial function in two powerful ways. It induces a process called mitophagy, which is getting rid of old and defective mitochondria and replacing them with new ones. And it also induces a process called mitochondrial biogenesis, or the production of new mitochondria. So the bottom line is that when people have been doing this diet for months or years, it doesn't happen overnight. I, I'm just going to let you know that now. So you don't do the ketogenic diet and you're not miraculously you're miraculously cured the next day. That's not the way it works. But if you do this diet for months or years, you are actually repairing or healing metabolically compromised cells in your brain and body. And those cells are getting rid of old and defective mitochondria that are probably causing or contributing to the metabolic impairment of those cells. And they're getting replaced with new healthy mitochondria. And that has the potential to heal people, sometimes long term. So in the epilepsy world, one of, you know, a lot of people think, so is this ketogenic diet like a life treatment, like a lifetime treatment? Do people have to do it forever? Right now in the mental health field, we don't have clear answers because it's early days. But what we do know from the epilepsy literature is that most people do not have to do the diet for life. They usually have to do the diet for anywhere from two to five years, but then they can often stop the diet and maintain all of the benefits that they got from it, that their body actually did heal itself over that two to five year period so that they can then stop the diet, eat whatever kind of a diet they want, and maintain the benefits. They don't, their seizures don't come back. The really exciting news is that we've got anywhere, I think like late last count, 10 to 15 controlled trials of the ketogenic diet for mental health conditions at leading institutions throughout the world. Harvard, Harvard, where I'm at, Stanford University, Oxford in the UK is doing a trial, University of Michigan, neuroscientists and psychiatrists are extraordinarily excited and enthusiastic about the possibilities of this metabolic therapy. So I want to situate this intervention for people. My understanding of classic keto, and please correct me if I have any misunderstandings here, is that it is really a very stringent diet, typically a four to one ratio by weight of fat to the combination of carbohydrate and protein. This is a serious intervention that is built for people who are having serious mental health issues and they have tried the various things and they have not gotten the relief that they're looking for. This is not something that somebody just embarks on casually most of the time. It is like a very significant intervention. And because of this, I'm just really curious. Um, ha have you seen inside of your own practice that people have had a hard time sustaining that diet because it is quite restrictive? You know, that is one of the most common questions I get is, it, and they, they usually put it a little yeah, it more feels like it would bluntly, be like, how on earth are you getting people with chronic mental illness, with schizophrenia, how are you getting them to do a diet? Yeah, well, just to cut in for one second here, Chris, we, we know that I, there's a ton of research, the challenges of getting people to stick to a diet or to get long-term benefits from it. Most of the people who start a diet stop relatively briskly, even if they sustain it, they regain the weight. You know, it's, it's really complicated stuff. It is. And so the one thing that I'll say is everything you said is absolutely correct. This is not, mm -hmm. this is a medical intervention. This is a medical yeah. diet. 
I, if you're using this for a serious brain disorder, I don't want you to just search the internet for the latest keto craze diet and wing it. Like, yeah, you're trying to treat a real brain disorder and you deserve really competent treatment. You deserve yeah, this is no you joke. deserve a shot. You deserve a real shot. So please get professional help so that you are giving this a fair chance, a, a, a reasonable chance that you can get good information on how to do this diet safely. The bottom line is that I, I'm never able to just say, go do the keto diet, come back and see me in three months and let me know how it's going. That, that never happens. And so if a clinician or a patient is hearing this or somebody who wants to try it is hearing, that's not the way it works. You're going to need a lot of education and support. And it's going to be a work in progress initially, just like any diet is. Nobody is perfect with any diet or any exercise routine or if they're trying to give up alcohol. Nobody's perfect. People will slip and that's expected. And so you're going to need support and education through all of that on how to do this. But what I'm finding, you know, I the, the man that I mentioned who started this diet in 2016 is still on the ketogenic diet six and a half years later has lost 160 pounds and has kept it off. He had chronic, unrelenting schizoaffective disorder. He was disabled by his illness. So some people say, so why him? Why can he do this when other people can't do a diet and stick with it? Because there's so much more on the line for him. Yeah, I think that's a really important point here. If he goes off the diet, and he has, trust me, he's gone off many times. When he goes off the diet, his symptoms come back with a vengeance sometimes. Yeah. He's now six years in, and so he's much better. He's actually much more resilient, and he can get away with cheating now because I think some of that healing is happening for him. But it's not. he's not fully recovered. He is not cured. We're st he's still on medicines. We're still making adjustments. We're still trying to get him to stop using some substances that are not good for him. So we're still, he, we're still a work in progress, but he's doing it and he's making progress. You know, it's interesting. I have one patient with bipolar disorder and her sister with chronic schizophrenia. They're both on the diet right now and they have two or three sisters who were also just on the diet to try to lose a little weight. And they all went to a wedding last week. Everybody who was trying to lose weight totally went off the diet. The two patients stuck to the diet religiously. They planned ahead. They brought their own food because they know this is my life. This isn't about weight. This isn't about weight. This is my life. I'm fighting for my life. I am fighting for my sanity. I am fighting to not be disabled. I want a normal life. The people that I know are desperate to get better. They will do anything to get better. And if we offer them support and encouragement and the other lifestyle things, because it's not just the diet. It, I want them sleeping. I, want, I don't want them using substances. I want them to have purpose. I don't want them being lonely. It's all of it, but give them a chance. Like we can get them better. For people who are suffering from the kind of significant mental illness that you're describing here, whether that's schizoaffective or bipolar or just debilitating uh, major depressive disorder, do you view these kinds of lifestyle-based uh, interventions, whether it's diet modification or it's one of the other things that we're gonna be talking about in a minute, as a replacement for or as more of a supplement to medication? Right at the outset, it's a supplement to medication. Changing yeah. medications is very dangerous, very difficult. So the first step always in my mind is I want to make sure that the patient can do the diet, is willing to do the diet, is, and we get them through all of the education. I make sure that they're committed to doing it. I will fully admit I've had patients who've said it's just too hard or it's too expensive. I can't afford all of that. So some people can't do it 
because of financial constraints. Some people just don't want to do it. Some people are in environments or homes where people aren't supporting them. Once we've established that they can do the diet and that the diet is working, that is when I do take a serious look at all of the treatments that they're on. And we look at possibly trying to slowly taper them off. That's what they do in the epilepsy field. So in the epilepsy field, you know, this the diet's usually only used in treatment resistant cases, which means that the medications haven't worked. They're probably giving yeah. them lots of side effects too. And so um so they usually will start the diet, see if the diet helps their seizures. If it helps even a little bit, most neurologists will then slowly but surely try to get people off of their epilepsy meds um, because it just improves quality of life. You don't have the side effects. I think that some patients really benefit from slowly but surely adjusting their meds. And if they can get off of them, they can do quite well sometimes. Yeah. And I just want to reinforce something that you said a moment ago there, Chris, which is that whenever we're talking about diet, we're talking about a spectrum of factors of which will is one of them, but is far from the only one. We're talking about financial factors, time factors, availability factors, uh, cultural issues around the kinds of food that we provide to people, the way that we think about uh, how we eat and how we look. And all of this can be incredibly complex for people. And there are situations, there are environments where people simply you know, don't have access to what they need in order to intervene using a diet. Now, if you are somebody who is, as you're describing, uh, dealing with a significant mental health issue and is seeing a psychiatrist and is in treatment for it, and you are resourced in these various ways, then absolutely it can be a phenomenal intervention for people. But what I think is really interesting is that you propose all of these other things in the book that are not dietarily based that do have a huge impact on metabolism that could also be accessible for people who maybe they're not dealing with a severe and debilitating bipolar disorder, but they are interested in improving their metabolic function for whatever reason. And I would love to talk uh, about a couple of them now. And one of the first ones that you mentioned, I think, is sleep and related to that light exposure. And would you mind explaining just a little bit about how that impacts our metabolism? People often underestimate the impact of sleep. Um, and the, the national statistics, at least in the United States, are that the majority of people are not getting enough sleep. Sleep is critically important to both metabolic health and mental health. And this is well established. Um, uh, so sleep deprivation can make every mental disorder worse and can actually lead to new onset mental disorders. So depression, bipolar, schizophrenia, substance use disorders. If you suffer from any of those disorders and you don't get good sleep, your illness is probably going to be worse the next day. Interestingly, all metabolic disorders get worse with sleep deprivation. If you're a diabetic and you don't sleep, your blood sugars go up. If you've got chest pain or if you've had a heart attack, you're at much higher risk the next day if you don't sleep well. Hmm. If, uh, if you are overweight or obese and you don't sleep, you are very likely to gain even more weight. Even if, like a lot of people think it's stress eating, and yeah, stress eating can happen, but even if you're not eating more, you will still gain weight because your metabolism is being harmed by the sleep deprivation. Mm. And um, so light is a really important part of training our circadian rhythms. And, and light, you know, there are two big picture issues with light. Let there be light in the morning and during the day and let there not be light at night. So it's both of those. So, and so many Americans nowadays are doing neither. So we, we often stay inside, minimal lighting in the house. We're not really getting outside. We're not getting exposed to sunlight or bright light, even through windows necessarily in the morning. And then we're on our phones or on television or whatever at night. And we're getting a lot of the bright blue light in our eyes. And that is disrupting our circadian rhythm. And we know that those things 
have adverse effects on, again, both mental health and metabolic health. And Mm -hmm. so the bottom line is get seven to eight hours of sleep if you're an adult. If you're a child, you might even need more than that. Um, And try to get some bright light in the morning. It could be taking a walk outside or just even stepping outside. Read. If you live in a northern climate like I do, I'm in Boston, sometimes you, you people get a bright light box that you can buy them on anywhere, Amazon, whatever. You can get them bright light therapy. You can use it in the morning and that can help train your circadian rhythm. So as I was going through this list of various interventions, you know, causes and fixes of these kinds of metabolic issues that people have, a lot of them made total natural sense to me. You know, sleep, fasting, exercise, dealing with your microbiome. We've talked about the microbiome on the show in the past. It's a big topic right now. Various nutritional deficiencies somebody can have. Um, Of course, being thoughtful or reducing uh, things like drug and alcohol consumption of different kinds, including caffeine, which is the big tough one for me. But then, you know, I wander my way to the end of this list and I find love, connection, and sense of purpose. And as a uh, psychologically inclined show, I found that totally fascinating. And I would love to hear about how that impacts our metabolism and metabolic function. We talked about it a little bit when we were talking about loneliness. Yeah. So mm-hmm. a lack of connection, loneliness are going to drive a stress response, which takes a metabolic toll on us. It's really interesting. Maybe I'll share the a tiny bit of the research So a lot of people know about mindfulness or meditation. Mm -hmm. Um, Some people are, you know, religion and spirituality are really important to them. They might pray every day. Um, And and that kind of is like meditation or mindfulness to them, or maybe not. Maybe they just see it as I'm praying to God every day. Now, so there are some researchers here in the Boston area that I've um, that I've known for a while, actually, who have been doing work in this space for decades. They consider themselves mind body medicine people, um, and so they are into if we can get people to do mindfulness or relaxation exercises, it can improve a whole host of things. It can improve not just mental health but it can also improve physical health. It can decrease blood pressure. It can decrease the chances that you'll have a heart attack. It can improve lifespan. And we have many lines of evidence all documenting that. But for the longest time, they weren't taken seriously. The medical establishment likes pills and we like mechanisms of action. We want to know, well, exactly how would that work? Um, And we're always worried about something called reverse causation, where, well, maybe the people who are already healthy can practice that mindfulness stuff. And so it's just circular logic. The reason people who practice mindfulness are living longer is because they're healthy enough to be able to do it. And they're part of the demographic group of people who take on mindfulness practices, all of that. Yeah, totally. Yeah, they're all rich, privileged people and they have nothing better to do than to sit around and be mindful. And so that's why it's working is you're just selecting for that. Well, these researchers were facing those kind of criticisms for years and decades. and But they were convinced this really works. It really helps people but they needed to show a mechanism of action. So they actually did a couple of studies trying to understand in granular detail what exactly is mindfulness or meditation doing to the human body that can result in a reduction in blood pressure, that can result in a reduction in risk for cardiovascular disease, that can result in improvement in mental health. How exactly Hmm. is this working? And they did all of these genetic studies looking at gene expression. What is mindfulness doing to gene expression? And can that help us understand what it's, what it's changing? Because they were pretty convinced the effects are really fast. Like they worked with people who were longtime meditators. And the meditator said, oh, no, I feel it right away. Like as soon as I do it, 30 minutes later, I'm a new person or I feel refreshed. So they knew that there was something happening. 
the results of all of those studies, what they found is that the two primary things that were being changed were mitochondria across the board, markers of mitochondrial biogenesis and mitochondrial health were being kind of stimulated by mindfulness or prayer or meditation, and insulin. Insulin is a metabolic hormone. It's, most people know it is relating to diabetes, but it's much more than just diabetes. Those were the big things. It also decreased inflammation and did some other things. But the results of all of that researchers, the researchers really honed in on this is affecting mitochondria and mitochondrial function. That is the huge glaring picture of all of our research. And that is why meditation and mindfulness can be helpful for both mental health and metabolic health. So one of the big questions as we come to the end here, Chris, that people in the field deal with all the time, and you're going to be intimately familiar with this one, and one of the big things that is hard for people to wrap their mind around in psychology and therapy is that two people can be exposed to very similar situations, and one of them might develop a mental illness from it, one of them might not. In the same way, somebody could be exposed to relatively few stressors at all and still develop a mental illness from it. And we have studies, great studies like the Kawhi Longitudinal Study that look at things like the impact of having one significant individual in a person's life, in this case a young child who's exposed to adverse conditions, and how that one meaningful relationship ended up insulating them over time and played a really big role in them uh, having more positive outcomes in life. And when I was reading through that section of the book, I, I was just remembering that, like the insulating role of connection as a key factor for people in how things turn out well or poorly for them in life, um, and the availability of other kinds of social resources or interpersonal resources that could have a huge impact on these things that we think of as, as not necessarily being closely related to that, but it turns out, as you're saying, that they're all interconnected in this very powerful way. They are. The details of the science get really complicated fast. Yeah. The good news is that we have more than enough to connect a lot of these dots. So for the scientists who want to study this, there are just countless opportunities to develop new treatments or new therapies that we might use. Um, but the stress response is massive. And the stress response for a lot of people at the end of the day is really about safety. Yeah. If we feel safe, that allows us to sleep, relax, and we use our metabolic resources to heal and restore our bodies. If we do not feel safe in the world, we have an exaggerated stress response for good reason. It's trying to save our lives. We have determined we're not safe. I'm not safe right here. I'm in a dangerous environment. Nobody's looking out for me. These people might try to hurt me. I need to be prepared to fight or flee. I have to be ready. Even if you don't fight or flee, just being prepared is taking metabolic resources. Your heart rate is higher than it normally would be. Your blood sugar is higher than it should be. All of these things are happening because your body is getting ready to defend itself. It's ready to fight if needed or run if needed. That is taking a toll on both your mental health and your metabolic health. And so the example that you give, having one charismatic adult, that charismatic adult is helping that child feel safe in the world, mm. is helping that child feel respected and valued in the world. And then that allows that child to go home and relax truly relax or sleep better that night. And that allows that child's 
metabolism to heal and repair and restore both the brain and the body. And that leads to better health, both mental health and physical health. And if that child doesn't have that, if that child is constantly feeling threatened and unsafe and less than other people, that child is going to be much more likely to develop both mental disorders and all of the metabolic disorders like heart attacks, strokes, diabetes, obesity, and premature mortality. Well, Dr. Palmer, thanks so much for doing this with me today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Forrest, for having me on. I had a great time talking today with Dr. Chris Palmer about his brain energy theory and more broadly, the various ways that our metabolic function impacts our mental health. We began today's conversation by talking about Chris's personal experience with mental illness and particularly the challenges that his mother faced, how he felt like his mother was not well served by our current mental health systems. And that was a major motivator for him to become a psychiatrist and to work inside of this field. Many people go through life with a condition that does not respond well to our currently available treatments, particularly to medication. Some people's problems are totally solved with medication, and maybe they experience some minor side effects. But for many people, they have tried 5, 10, 15 different medications, or maybe they're on them simultaneously in some cases, in order to control debilitating symptoms associated with mental illness. And they're just not getting better. And Chris was really interested in discovering why this was the case, and also in untangling and unpacking all of these other questions that we have related to mental health. Why is it that there are all of these different diagnoses inside the DSM? That's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. It's kind of like psychiatry's uh, Bible of diagnosis. And there are all of these different diagnoses, but they have all of these symptoms that kind of overlap with each other in different ways. And then we have issues around comorbidity, where somebody has one ailment and that makes them far more likely to have all of these other ailments. And, you know, what is even really the difference between a mental state and a mental illness? And he was really interested in all of this. And so he was looking for a theory that united all of these different aspects and answered all of these different questions. And what he landed on was the function of our metabolism, and particularly the behavior of mitochondria, which are these organelles that are found in large numbers in most cells in which biochemical processes uh, like respiration and energy production occur. And it turns out that if you start digging into the research, what you find is that most of the medications that we have, most of the pills that people take, impact metabolism in some way. And then even treatments like psychotherapy can have an impact on our metabolism as well, because the bottom line is that stress impacts metabolism. If you are doing a stress reduction activity of almost any kind for a long enough period of time, you're affecting your metabolism. And this includes everything from gaining greater coping skills to building stronger connections and relationships to changing the behaviors and habits that might cause you additional stress. And that then leads to his brain energy theory that mental illnesses, mental disorders of various kinds are metabolic disorders of the brain. And that R is really important here because it's not that mental disorders are caused by metabolic dysfunction. They are metabolic dysfunction. And so what this means critically is that if we're able to help somebody restore proper metabolic function and uh, empower our mitochondria in various healthy ways, then they might see relief from the various symptoms that they're experiencing associated with their mental illness, maybe even the symptoms that we have had the hardest time treating in more conventional ways. One of the first cases that was really impactful for Dr. Palmer in his development of this theory was when he was working with a particular client who had gained a considerable amount of weight as a result of taking medication for schizoaffective disorder. And so Chris worked with this client, uh, got him on a particular diet, the ketogenic diet, that was actually created as a medical diet for the treatment of epilepsy. And this patient experienced all of the things that you would imagine associated with that diet. But really critically, something unexpected happened, and that's that the hallucinations associated with it 
began to go away. And we discussed the keto diet in some detail during our conversation. And something that I just want to hammer again at the end here that we did already talk about, but I just want to reinforce, is that this is a medical intervention. This is an intervention for people who are experiencing significant levels of mental illness that they either don't want to take medication for, for a variety of understandable reasons, or they've tried all of the medications for it and they still aren't getting the relief that they want. It is a serious intervention that is done with the supervision often of a doctor. It is no joke. We're talking about a four to one ratio by weight of fat to the combination of carbohydrates and proteins in a person's diet. It is very restrictive. It is challenging for people to stick to. This is the sort of thing people do when there is a serious reason for them to be doing it, not because they just want to lose a couple of pounds. And one of the things that I appreciate about Chris's work and one of the things about it that I think has been kind of undercovered is that there are a thousand other things that a person can do if, for whatever reason, they don't want to go into dietary modification. We can look at things like sleep and light exposure, the amount of exercise that somebody is getting, uh, the strength of their relationships, whether or not they feel fulfilled by their work or their life in general. Everything from our consumption of drugs and alcohol to improving the gut's microbiome to supplementing various vitamins to just the amount of walking around that we're doing on a daily basis can impact our metabolism. And that means that these are all points of intervention for people who are experiencing psychological challenges that are more on the mild to moderate side of the spectrum that maybe don't rise to the level of where we would look at a hardcore intervention like serious keto for them. And I talked with Chris a little bit after we stopped recording about this other case study where he was working with a client who had been dealing with serious, serious feelings of burnout. And they were planning on retiring from a job that had given them significant feelings of meaning and purpose throughout the course of their life. They had been very successful. It was a real source of pride for them. And even so, they just felt overwhelmed. They felt complete, like they couldn't do it anymore. And Chris started working with this person and just doing a series of pretty common sense lifestyle interventions of different kinds, looking at how much sleep they were getting, working on their circadian rhythm, a little bit more exercise, cutting out some of the more problematic things inside of their diet, a lot of excess refined sugar, a lot of excess processed food. And they were thankfully in a position where they were able to make those changes. That was plausible for them. And it completely changed their symptomology. They were no longer burnt out. They were fulfilled again by what they were doing. They felt like they had all of this extra energy. And the more time that I've spent learning about mental health and just doing this work in general, the greater appreciation that I've gained for the, the obvious interplay between the mind and the body, whatever language you want to put on it, our metabolic systems, mitochondria, all of the details that we went into over the course of the conversation about how these systems are linked up to each other in different kinds of ways. Uh, we talked in some detail about how mitochondria produce various neurotransmitters the ones like serotonin, norepinephrine, dopamine that we talk about all the time on the podcast as being essential for healthy functioning and essential for the kinds of good feelings that we want more of in our lives. And it's such a great reminder of how much of our experience of the world and our experience of ourselves, our experience of these, these intimate processes, like emotional processes, are ultimately driven, at least in part, by our biology, by our brain chemistry. And so if we can intervene in various ways in our life with our biology to impact our, our psychological experience in powerful and positive ways. Wow, what an incredible line of intervention that is. And for such a long time in the field, these kinds of basic physiological interventions were, were just not given the level of credit that they really should have been. And I'm really grateful for work like uh, the work that Dr. Palmer is doing, books like Brain Energy, that really just highlight the interplay of these two systems. So I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you've been listening for a while and would like to support the podcast, please subscribe to it wherever you're listening to it now on. It's the best way that we have to reach new people. 
If you'd like to support us in other ways, you can find us on Patreon. It's patreon.com slash beingwowpodcast. And for the cost of just a couple of dollars a month, you can support the show and you'll get a bunch of bonuses in return. Again, Dr. Palmer's book is Brain Energy, and I've included a link to it in the description of today's episode. So that's it for today. Thanks again for listening, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.